Aunt Rachel, Aunt Rachel never called living with the Waurani her work. She always called it her reward. She had been faithful before in doing what God had given her to do, and this was her prize. And she loved living with the Waurani. She loved their culture. She loved the people. Um, uh, and then it was when she died that I went down to help bury her out in the jungles um, and um, with the Waurani who had adopted me and had adopted her. And um, it was after we buried her that the Waurani told me that they decided it was time for me, now grown up, uh, to come back and live with them. So tell us how that led to starting iTech, because that's really one of the pivotal points in the story. Well, by then I had spent 20 years here in the States and having grown up in Ecuador, and I'm actually an Ecuadorian citizen as well as a U.S. citizen, um, it took me a long time to figure out, you know, how the values and how how to work in this North American culture. And um, so when the Waurani came to me after Aunt Rachel's, after, I mean, the same day that we buried her, um, and this, they, this was in the mid-90s? 94. 94. And they said, um, we've decided now, you come and live with us again. And I said, um, what, what, what would I do? What do you want me to do? And they said, we cannot do. They said, foreigners always want to come in here, and they do and do for us, but they never teach us to do. And because they don't speak our talk, they can they can do they can fix our teeth they can do you know other things uh, they can fix our radios, but they can't talk to the people and tell the rest of the people how to walk God's trail. And I said, you know, where's this going? So what do you want me to do? And they said, no, we said not do. We want you. And then they reminded me how ignorant I was when I'd gone out there as a boy, and they had to teach me all these things so I could live like true people live, um, hunting and fishing and uh, following trails and knowing, you know, what's dangerous and what's not dangerous. And uh, I, they said, um, now that you've lived with the foreigners and you know how to do the things that they do, we say coming now you teach us to do the things that they do so that we can go and the people will see us well so that we can tell them how to walk God's trail. And um, I said, like, what things do you want to learn how to do? I mean, I was trying to think, you know, you people don't read and write, at least not on paper. You don't count above 20. Um, you know, math is <laughs> something that they just they didn't need to do. And now they were smart in their own and had good technology. They knew the ways of the jungles so that I was in deep admiration of them. But um, they said they wanted to learn the the beam will be at, the medicine thing. But I wasn't a doctor, so I said, what else? And they said, we want to learn to do the baga be at, the the tooth thing, like John, like you do. And uh, I wasn't a dentist, so I couldn't teach them to do that. And I said, uh, what else? And they said, and unless we learn to do the ibobia, the airplane thing, how can we go from place to place and, and do these other things? And I thought, I do know the ibobia. I do know how, you know, about flying, but I thought, you people are asking me to, you want to jump from the Stone Age to the Space Age in one jump, and I thought, that, that'll that never happen. So I said, let's talk about the bagabia some more, the two thing. And um, that was really the uh, that was really the Waurani's. It was their idea. They were saying, if you would teach us to do these things, um, like Jesus did. Remember, Jesus fed the five thousand when there wasn't a place for them to go get food, and um, and then when Jesus left, then the then the uh, disciples started. You know, God started doing miracles through them, and that's why the people followed Jesus. That's why the people listen to the disciples, and uh, the Waurani knew that if they could meet people's felt needs, like uh, son Jamie says, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. 
um, they figured out if we could do the medicine thing and the tooth thing, if we could do the fixing thing, if we could do the airplane thing, then we could go ourselves and we could take care of our people's felt needs and then they would see us well and then we would teach them how to follow God's trail. If they saw it well, then they could, they too could follow God's trail. So the whole idea of training and equipping um, frontier people for ministry to their own people, both physical and spiritual, that was really the Waurani's idea. Um, so we tried it with them and found, you know, you don't have to go to uh, 20 some years of school to learn how to do the Baga Bia. You learn how to drill them, and pull them, and fill them, and and they 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 became extremely adept. And then other tribes in Ecuador started asking me, uh, "Would you teach us like you taught the Waurani?" And I said, "No." I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to reinvent the equipment and stuff for the Waurani. And then the Waurani heard, and they got upset, and they said, why do you say, oh, you say yes to us, but you say no to the Quechua's, and you say no to the Shuad? I said, how am I going to teach all of them? And they said, no, no, you don't understand. Now you're thinking like a foreign again. You teaching us will teach the other people. And I thought, yeah, that's likely. You don't speak their language. You, I mean, you're you're considered the most behind, the most savage of all the tribes in Ecuador. Um, but then in Minkai and I, long story, but we ended up in India with a um, with an IDENT team from ITEC, and um, uh, Minkai wasn't going to say anything because he knew they all could read, so they would know better. But then uh, a couple of the pastors that were learning to do the Baga Bia thing so they could go into Hindu communities without being killed, uh, they started pulling a woman's tooth, a canine tooth up here. I think that's what you call it, don't you? That inside of the, this one right here, anyway. And they started pulling her tooth, but it had beautiful teeth, except for that one that had been abscessing, and you could tell it was bad and it was hurting and needed to come out. And so they called um, our training dentist from um, Kentucky, and he went over and he looked at that and he said, man, I only pull a few teeth a year. He said, I do mostly cosmetic dentistry. And then he looked at me and he said, uh, you said Minkai's been pulling teeth and stuff out in the jungles. He said, ask Minkai what he would do if he was going to pull this woman's tooth. Well, that's pretty abstract. Minkai realized nobody else knew what to do, so he held up his hands because everybody's wearing gloves and said, I don't I don't have those things that you put on your hands. So I put gloves on him, and he pulled that woman's tooth. And uh, then he put his hands on her face, and somebody was videotaping this just with a home recorder, and he put his hands on her face and started praying for her. Well, I'd been supporting her jaw while Minkai was doing it and rubbing her jaw uh, because I'd been taught that that would reduce the swelling. So I had my hands on her face, and he put his hands on her face over mine and uh, and prayed, and he said, Mampo Inui, Father Creator, this tooth has been a problem for her, but it, but he said, but her big problem is inside that she doesn't know how to follow your trail. And he said, I fixed her tooth, but you send some of these other people to teach her how to walk your trail. And, uh, you know, I looked at those old warrior hands over mine, and I thought, you know, this really is quite a story. These are the same hands that drove a spear into my dad's um head and killed him and uh, here he is gently praying for this woman halfway around the world um, he can't speak their language doesn't know their culture but he knows that this woman she had the red dot on her forehead which I had told him meant that she had been to the Hindu temple to uh, say prayers and they had given her the red dot and um, 
it, it reminded me of um, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia when when Aslan has died and Lucy and um, Susan, I think it is, the two little girls are just broken hearted because Aslan, um, the lion, has died. And then and then Aslan starts coming back to life and they said, Aslan, Aslan, how is it that you can be alive when you were dead? And uh, Aslan, in uh, C.S. Lewis's words, he says, there's a there's a magic that the world doesn't know about. He said when when a willing victim or when a willing victim dies in a traitor's stead, life begins to work back or death begins to work backwards. Then then from death you start coming back to life. And I thought uh, you know that's what's happened here. Here's Minkai who said, you know, you, one of the people said, if you teach us how to take care of the people's physical needs, then we can teach them how to walk God's trail. And uh, then he, they said, you don't have to teach everybody. You teach us and we'll teach the other people. Here's Minkai way out in in a little community outside of, um, can you remember the city? that we're Hyderabad. In? Hyderabad, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, in a place in a community that had just a couple months before had taken a young pastor, Christian pastor, and had poured battery acid down his throat to kill him to show the other Christians, don't come here, we're going to kill you. And here they were having a, a dental clinic, and the people had a ribbon-cutting ceremony for the same people, and it was that when they came to fix the people's teeth, the people didn't care what their creed was. They didn't care that they wanted to um, proselytize them, you know, that they wanted to, you know, share with them the news of another religion that was foreign to them. They only cared that they had come to fix their teeth. And uh, here was Minkai out there in this little community outside of Hyderabad, uh, and they they got in touch with me, the the group of pastors, and they said, "Now we've got another problem." And I said, "What's that?" And they said, now everybody's demanding that we come to their villages to fix their teeth. And they said, there's not enough of us. Uh, you need to train some others. So our team went back and trained uh, two or three of the the most adept uh, students to actually become trainers. And years later, I was in Damo, another city in India, uh, just observing. And uh, when we showed up, Two of the um, pastor uh, dentists had come from uh, Hyderabad, had 24 hours by train because they said, no, we're going to train them and you watch us do it and see if we do it right. It works. And Minkai was there.